Thank you for starting your day with us. Our top story this hour, flags are being lowered to half mass and a minute silence will be held today in Belgium as police investigate the killing of two officers and a 22-year-old man on the streets of Liège. But amid the morning, there is growing anger and questions about how the attacker was released from prison just two days before. Our correspondent Brian Carter is live in Liège this morning. Brian. Well, Tessa, I'm standing right in front of the cafe where the two police officers were killed yesterday. Another man was shot in a car nearby, and then the suspect went over to a school about 100 meters away from here where he took two hostages before being shot and killed by police. But before going into the identity of the suspect, let me show you a quick video quickly summarizing uh, yesterday's events. <laughs> Gunshots in the city center of Liège, the moment police shoot dead a gunman who earlier that day attacked two of their fellow officers. Heavily armed officers rushed to help two female police who were attacked from behind with a knife. The attacker then grabbed a gun from one of the wounded women and shot them both. He then approached a vehicle, shooting dead a 22-year-old man sitting in the passenger seat of a parked car and took a woman hostage in a nearby school. When the police arrived, he opened fire again injuring several officers before he was shot dead. It's clear that the aim of the assassin was to attack the police. Because this is what he did first by hiding behind the two police officers. And after that, slaughtering them savagely from the back. Brian, what do we know so far about the investigation? Well, what we do know is that the suspect is 36-year-old Benjamin Herman, a man originally from Rochefort, which is a town here in southern Belgium. He was convicted multiple times for different crimes like robbery and drug trafficking. He's been described as an extremely violent and unstable individual. And as uh, he was due for release in 2020 after serving his sentence. And as part of his uh, reintegration process into society, he was allowed on these uh, short-term leaves. Now, uh, uh, he had been on uh, several short-term leaves, but yesterday was obviously the first during which he uh, committed a crime. Uh, what we do know as well is that uh, he apparently was radicalized uh, while in prison, while uh, being in contact with other radicalized uh, individual, and he apparently converted uh, to Islam uh, last year. But as I said, the investigation is ongoing to determine exactly what was his motive, why he acted in such a way, and why he was allowed to get uh, to go on his uh, short-term leave despite his uh, violent behavior. What we also know is that his name appeared in two different internal security reports from the Belgian government uh, who described him as violent and described him as being in contact with a radicalized individual, but he wasn't suspected of being a terrorist uh, himself. Now, uh, it's uh, the investigation, sorry, has been handed over to the federal prosecutor of Belgium, uh, who oversees these terror-related matters, and we should know more in the days and weeks to come. But at the time, this is a time for mourning. As you can see, flowers have been laid here, and people have been coming here to pay their respect. There will be a minute silence later on here in Liège, and a register has all been, also been opened uh, at the city hall, where people can come and pay their respect to yesterday's uh, victims of this lady latest uh, attack here in Liège. Tessa? All right, thank you for that, uh, Brian Carter, live in Liège. And we are learning more about the victims of yesterday's attack, and our team in the Cube, our social media news desk, has been working on this part of the story. Belle, what do you have for us? Yes, details are emerging, Tessa, and still continue to emerge about the victims. And, of course, the online world is where a flurry of information and misinformation emerges after an attack like this one. Here at the Cube, we are not in the business of bringing you speculation. So everything I'm about to tell you has been verified. We've been able to verify it personally ourselves with our team here here at the Cube working since yesterday's attack on this. Uh, now I'm going to take you first of all to this. These are two of the victims, two mothers that we're seeing here. And this image comes from the Liège police Facebook page. They were two female police officers. Uh, one of them had twin daughters aged 13. That is Soraya Belkasemi. Now those twin daughters are now orphans after their father, who was also a police officer, was killed previously 
Uh, the other woman that we see here is Lucille Garcia. She had a 25-year-old son that she leaves behind. And the police here in their post saying they're paying tribute to their two fallen colleagues. They're saying there are no words to describe the emotion that we feel. Uh, the other victim, a 22-year-old man. Here we go. This is from his... He, Cyril, his name was. And he played Lawn Bowls. This is from his Lawn Bowls Provincial Association saying that they that they're announcing his death uh, as uh, of Cyril van Grieken and they're saying that the circumstances under which he died were tragic and here we talk about a brilliant man full a, a future full uh, and on and off the pitch this was someone whose politeness and kindness shone through uh, now as as more, more and more details emerge, it becomes clear that there are bits of information that we can trust, bits of information that we can't trust. And here at The Cube, our job is to ensure, Tessa, that we're always bringing you the information that you can trust. All right, thank you for that, Bell and The Cube team. Now, as Brian mentioned earlier, the suspect was said to have been radicalized in prison. And that's an issue that many European countries are dealing with right now. Our correspondent, Annelies Borges, has been digging into that part of the story. Uh, Annelies, so what do you have for us on this? This is really a Europe-wide problem. Absolutely, Tessa. Attacks like the one in Liège yesterday certainly raised concern about how Europe's prisons seem to be turning into incubators for radicalism. We've seen this happen in Belgium, but also here in France, where convicts have been behind several attacks in recent months. And the vast majority of these convicts didn't really come from a religious background. They were EU nationals who actually converted in detention and so a lot of questions are being raised about what exactly is happening inside these prisons why are authorities failing to tackle the problem here in france authorities have come up with a plan france that has more than 500 people serving time for terrorism related offenses and another 1100 people who have been flagged as having been radicalized well france is coming up with this plan of isolating these prisoners of creating separate cells separate wings inside prisons to house these people but of course eventually they will come out of prisons and so the question is what happens then eu officials are scrambling to put together a plan that involves prisons but also schools social workers and even the sports world tessa to try and fight radicalization on a national and european level all right thank you for that uh, and lisa borges reporting there now to Italy, where voters could be headed back to the polls in a matter of weeks. This as a political crisis continues to escalate and spreads fear beyond its borders. The latest prime minister-designate, Carlo Cottarelli, did not unveil his new cabinet on Tuesday as planned. That's officially been postponed to today. But there are doubts as to whether he secured support from major parties for even a stopgap government. Uh, meanwhile, financial markets are tumbling and Italy's borrowing costs are soaring. NBC's correspondent Claudio Lavanga is in Rome following all the twists and turns. Claudio, this is really turning out to become a thriller. What do you have for us today? Good morning, Tessa. There seem to be no end to this unpredictable uh, political drama. As you said, twists and turns all around. Now, the last one is that Carlo Cotarelli, as you said, is going back to the presidential palace this morning to speak again to the president. He could do two things once he's there. One, hand over the final list of the ministers you'd like to be part of his caretaker government. Two, resign, step down before he's even sworn in as prime minister. Well, why? Because it's becoming increasingly clear that without the support of Luigi Di Maio and Matteo Salvini, the two winners of the election, and also the leaders of the two parties that hold the majority in the two houses, the Senate and the lower house of parliament, he can't do anything uh, in that uh, government, apart from babysit uh, the parliament until there are new elections, which could be as early as September or uh, even July at this point. Because if there is no government, then Italians will have to be called back to the polls as soon as possible. But there is yet another twist in this drama. This time it comes from Luigi Di Maio, the leader of the Five Star Movement. Now, he dropped the call for the impeachment uh, for uh, the president, uh, Mattarella, and he said he's now ready for, to talk about, uh, again about it and to, he's open to reasonable, a reasonable solution to this crisis. That means that he's back into wanting to go into the government with uh, the League. But for that, he needs the blessing of the president, but also the blessing of his partner, uh, in this case, Matteo Salvini, who may be more keen to go to new elections because his party, the League, since the elections two months ago, has shot up by 10 points and now is at 27%. And he may see 
the opportunity here if he goes it, uh, if he runs again with the center uh, right coalition to just go it alone and rule Italy all by himself, Tessa. All right, thank you for that, uh, Claudio Lavanga. Now, the unfolding political crisis has spooked markets and put the EU on alert. And for more on this, I'm joined by your news uh, correspondent, Alistair Sanford. Uh, Alistair, I just want to take a look at the damage that came from, you know, what's been happening since yesterday. So you have the euro that fell to its lowest level against the dollar since July 2017. In Louise borrowing costs, the yield on 10-year bonds, it breached 3% in trading. That's the highest level in four years. And the Moody's ratings agency put Italy's credit rating on review for a possible downgrade. So, Alistair, clearly a lot of fear out there. Can you put that in context for me? How worried should Europe be? Well, clearly, Tessa, this seems more serious this time. The fear is that if there are early elections, they could become a referendum on Italy's membership of the euro, even Italy's place in the European Union itself. And there's a real possibility, of course, that a Eurosceptic government comes to power. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? It depends on your point of view. What we can say is that President Mattarella's gamble, if you like, of trying to block this Eurosceptic coalition to reassure the markets, well, that's completely backfired. It's caused utter panic. Um, did the markets overreact? There are important factors to bear in mind. On the question of the euro itself, neither of the Eurosceptic parties, Five Star or the, the League, actually had a commitment to ditch the euro. Uh, and a clear majority of Italians, according to opinion polls, more than 60 percent, actually want to stay in the single currency. However, it's the Eurosceptic programs that are causing shudders around the markets as well. If a government comes to power and blows EU fiscal rules out of the water, uh, that's going to cause even more panic. The fears are there'll be a Greek scenario and we know that uh, Italy is sort of said to be too big to fail and that a bailout would be impossible. We're going to see enormous pressure from Paris, from Berlin, from Brussels, from all the uh, financial and EU institutions for Italy to do the right thing to keep existing fiscal policy on the euro. The danger for the EU establishment is that that becomes on a collision course with the big political question of who rules Italy. And we saw that surge yesterday when there was panic in EU circles in Brussels. Uh, one commissioner uh, said that Italians should be warned by what's happening in the markets. And that prompted Jean-Claude Juncker to, to say, no, Italy's not ruled by financial markets. It, it governs itself. A lot's going to depend on how the Eurosceptic parties respond to this, what's in their political interests, and how will Italians themselves react to all for this sure. turbulence. For sure, Europe is keeping a close eye on this. Thank you for that, Alistair Sanford. Now, a Russian journalist has been shot dead in his home in Ukraine. Arkady Babchenko, who was a vocal Kremlin critic, had moved to Ukraine last year to get away from what he described as death threats. Nick Wells has the story. Arkady Babchenko knew he was a marked man. The prominent Russian journalist and Kremlin critic had fled to Ukraine following death threats over articles he'd written. Ukrainian lawmaker Anton Gerashenko wrote on Facebook that Babchenko went out to buy some bread and that the killer was waiting for him when he returned to his flat. He was reportedly shot several times in the...